welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello everyone and welcome to the Madden America podcast. I am Ayur Dhidhar, your host for today. I am an instructor of psychology at the University of West Georgia and a science news writer for the Mad in America website. A lot has been going on in the world of mental health in the past month or so. Marcy Weber was given conditional discharge after being detained in a psychiatric facility. Weber had killed her daughter during a psychotic episode that erupted while she was on a cocktail of psychiatric drugs. Another review published in the British Medical Journal found evidence of substantial spin in the abstracts of leading psychology and psychiatry journals. And in a recent study in Australia, researchers found that sexual assault survivors reported higher rates of depression and PTSD when their disclosure was met with disbelief or ignored. You can read these and a lot more on the Madden America website. Today we have with us Dr. Joseph Kahn. Dr. Gaughan is a professor in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and in the Faculty of Medicine at Harvard University. He has published over 75 articles and he studies the intersection of culture, coloniality, and well-being in the indigenous communities. Dr. Gaughan is also a peacetime veteran of the U.S. Army and recently published a review detailing the complexity in the concept of indigenous historical trauma. Dr. Gaughan, welcome to Mad in America. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to join you. So let's dive in. My first question to you is, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you became interested or when you became interested in the problems that plagued the American Indian community? Was there, a, was, there, was there an origin story of some sort? Well, when I was an undergraduate, um, I took some psychology courses and became quite enamored. There was almost an epiphany where I realized that the discipline of psychology has so much room to move within it. Um, in psychology, you can do brain science. You can also ask questions almost as to the foundations of what it means to be human. So they're quite philosophical. Uh, you can be very applied in terms of trying to help people through psychotherapy. Right. Or you can be a basic researcher who never leaves your lab. And I was someone who always loved ideas. So that was important to me. But I also very much wanted to contribute to American Indian communities. Uh, I myself am uh, Ani Grovant, uh, a, a member of the tribal nation in Montana and the Fort Belknap Reservation. And so a lot of my uh, aspirations were about how to not only contribute something to my own people, but to Indian people more generally. So I went and got my doctorate in uh, clinical community psychology. Clinical psychology is about the assessment and treatment of mental illness, of course. Right. Um, community psychology was a breakaway renegade effort from the 1960s that was very critical of the kind of medicalizing approach that psychology took yeah. when it adopted clinical training and experience. And so my doctoral program was this interesting hybrid that had uh, opportunity to explore all kinds of ideas and tension. Um, what is the role of psychology? Should it be about social context or should it be about altering or transforming individuals, for example? Um, is diagnosis and psychopathology useful mm -hmm. or rather should we be thinking about systems and oppression and discrimination and those sorts of things? Um, and this led me, in the end, uh, to work with two really talented uh, faculty mentors. Uh, Julian Rappaport was a very influential community psychologist um, uh, who got his start in the 60s when it was breaking away. Um, and the developmental cultural psychologist, Peggy J. Miller, was really important in helping understand and think through narrative mm -hmm. and its relationship to cultural right. Um, life and minded mentality. So with these two mentors and some others who were very helpful along the way, it allowed me to chart uh, an interdisciplinary course. So I am a psychologist by training, uh, including uh, know how to do psychotherapy and clinical assessment at the same time that I really do draw on occurrence and trends in medical anthropology and psychological anthropology um, in the effort to apply critical theory um, to um, the work of a psychological science, uh, all in ultimate service, I hope, to indigenous societies and communities. Thank you. Critical theory has, uh, has personally been something that kind of changed my perspective towards, you know, uh, the way I looked at psychology too. Um, so going further with this, um, you've talked about historical losses that the indigenous people have incurred. And until today, you know, they suffer because of the decisions that were made a long, long time ago. Could you speak to the nature of some of these historical losses? Um, I read in your paper about the loss of land and the loss of language and uh, talk about how they still plague the community today. Losses is a great term for it because indigenous people in the United States have lost an awful lot. And lost is a little bit too passive. 
uh, it hasn't just been lost, it's been extinguished, eradicated. Um, we've been deprived of a lot. And uh, that has to do with the entire colonial encounter. So um, European powers who uh, colonized uh, what now is the United States um, came to dispossess Indian people of our land. And in that process, uh, dispossessed us of much else. In many instances, we were just dispossessed of our lives altogether through military violence and conquest. Um, but beyond that, often dispossessed of well-being and of ability to uh, determine for ourselves what our future should be like, particularly for our children and our grandchildren. Um, we were kept captive on reservations um, early in American history and uh, often under very impoverished conditions that would lead to starvation or disease outbreak. Um, in general, uh, the United States expected American Indian people to vanish. Um, and was just waiting for that day to happen so that we would no longer be a problem population within the body politic. Um, but that never happened, thankfully. Um, you know, the bottoming out of our population was around 1890 and 1900, when there were perhaps 240,000 Native people left. Uh, today, there are millions of people who identify as American Indian Alaska Native, including over 270 federally recognized tribal communities and scores of state recognized tribal communities beyond that. And so, um, Despite all odds, we have persisted, we have survived. And our survival is uh, marked um, by an awareness and recognition of these losses. Those losses are something we carry in the way that lots of populations who've been victimized, subjugated, oppressed in, throughout history um, can carry those things. And one way that we make meaning of those um, is uh, a, a, a an acute historical awareness about the ways in which um, we need to determine for ourselves what our futures can be, finding continuity with the past in ways that America did not want us to do originally. Um, so um, one important uh, consequence of our uh, colonization are enduring um, mental health inequities or disparities, um, particularly in the realm of addiction and trauma and suicide. Um, and these inequities didn't arise because our brain suddenly went bad or we had bad genes suddenly. This came about in the uh, process of conquest, colonization, dispossession, and so on. And, um, and so when we think about these problems today that are very present and real in every extended Indian family throughout Indian country, um, we have to figure out how best to make sense of them. And the common, ordinary way to make sense of them that we might inherit from the mental health professions is there's something wrong with this person. And this person is in need of desperate remedy, perhaps therapy, perhaps some other way of in, intervening in their individual bodies and lives uh, to restore them to well-being. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of this stuff is shared, it's collective, and it's passed down um, from original kinds of activities of impoverishment and subjugation, such that that historical context is really important. And one way it's important, in contrast to the person blaming explanations that are so prevalent in the mental health professions, is to um, recognize that these arose for our entire community as a result of these colonial encounters. Um, that it's not that you as an individual are somehow deficient um, and uh, that you are to blame for the fact that you are lost to addiction and maybe you've neglected your kinship obligations or not raised your children in the ideal way in your own household. Um, which is paralyzing. If you feel that way, it's very hard sometimes to recover an idea of a, a, a healthy, happy, or normal, good, uh, valuable self and to press onward. Um, but if you can reframe those kinds of uh, difficulties as a legacy that many of us share, too many of us share because of uh, our victimization in the past, then that can suddenly empower you to decide to change in ways that can matter profoundly. And so a historical trauma is the concept that has been used to try to capture this very interesting dynamic of recognizing that we have serious problems today, while at the same time wanting to anchor and tether the origin of those problems to our histories of oppression so that we can get out of those uh, paralyzing self-blame and the idea that we're so deficient um, and so damaged in an effort to change for the better. Um, and so it's meant to really try to re-socialize a series of problems that have been medicalized for a long time. And the medicalization of those problems has led to this kind of individuation and the uh, individual as the site of therapeutic engagement. 
Um, and rather now, um, with historical trauma, we can start to see that it's about broader things than this individual or that individual. It's about entire communities that have been deliberately impoverished historically and that are in need of desperate uh, remedy that maybe looks less like healing in some instances and more like justice. I really like what you say about uh, loss being almost a kind of a passive term in this case, useful but still passive. So let me ask you a more specific question then. Um, we know that psychology and psychiatry has come a long way, but it has had a pretty dark and racist past, and we can see it in um, the diagnosis of African American men around the Civil War, you know, era, and when they took part in protests. And so, um, because I'm completely unaware of this, I would like to ask if, um, for the American Indian population, were there any ways in which psychology um, contributed to the culture of discrimination against them? Um, did that ever happen? Uh, in particular? Yeah, I'm trying to bring to mind particular ways in which um, psychiatric or psychological concepts or categories may have played out in Indian country. So I think within the realm of uh, kind of anthropologically informed psychology of indigenous mm -hmm. peoples, there were a lot of ideas about primitivity right. um, that played out in ways that um, were all part of the package of American campaign to assimilate Indian people into civilized mm -hmm. life. Um, and that, of course, was very devastating in so many ways. It's not that Indian people wouldn't want to know how to read and write and mm -hmm. speak in English and do all those things, but maybe wouldn't have signed on for Christianization mm -hmm. um, or um, a kind of education system that was only preparing us for the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic hierarchy. Yeah. Um, and so there were problems, certainly, um, but I think um, what's interesting is to consider the ways in which indigenous communities have developed as a, a result or a response, a uh, kind of parallel way of thinking and talking about psychiatric and psychological problems and their remedies. Yeah. You mentioned something um, a little while ago. You said, uh, you know, indigenous historical trauma has become this new concept that is, that is gaining widespread recognition. Could you say something about uh, what you found lacking about the old concept? What was it like? Was it just a homogenous monolithic PTSD thing that you guys were working against, uh, but what were the things you found lacking in the way we were talking about trauma that you thought it was important to come up with, you know, something that spoke to the experience of Indigenous people? Well, I think Indigenous historical trauma arose, I think, as a synthesis of two older, pretty readily familiar concepts. Um, those older concepts are historical oppression, which, mm -hmm. of course, Native people have been talking about for centuries, um, and uh, psychological trauma, which uh, burst into the mental health profession right. really in 1980 right. with the creation of PTSD. Right. Right. So you're right to invoke PTSD or post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder because that is the crystallization of the pathology of trauma mm -hmm. that um, legitimated that kind of uh, suffering in ways that became uh, a, a medical or health concern. So by wedding historical oppression and psychological injury or psychological trauma, we have kind of a new way of talking about the suffering that results in the context of those historical uh, uh, events and activities. And uh, the result is now we have a new way to label this suffering, to talk about this suffering that both recognizes a broader social context and historical context, mm -hmm. um, and that also languages it in a way that's new and fresh and different such that it can command uh, attention, interest, and perhaps um, redress in a way mm -hmm. that older concepts kind of wear out after you right. use them. Right. So a big part of it, I think, is about languaging and about the rhetorical strategy of how you always have to be inventing a new terms for the kinds of suffering you might uh, be contending with in order to get attention. And when it comes to indigenous peoples, because we are such a small proportion of the national population, um, a great deal of our effectiveness at uh, getting our needs addressed has to do with j just obtaining a hearing. Mm -hmm. And so being creative and fresh with our language in ways to uh, designate and identify things is crucial to getting media to pick it up and getting right. brokers and policymakers to listen. Um, and now historical trauma has uh, become so widespread. The question I suppose is, well, if once it becomes not as fresh, then what's next? Yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you there. Absolutely. For that matter, I've heard other people talk about similar frustrations with some of the concepts that they had to deal with and some of the way they were talking about diagnosis. And um, I interviewed uh, Dr. Diana Kapua, who is a Maori psychiatrist. So she works with the indigenous people of, you know, New Zealand. And uh, she herself, you know, is I think the first Maori psychiatrist to ever 
Mm-hmm. And she has had to develop a completely different way of conceptualizing Maori suffering and experience because she kept butting her head against the diagnosis that did not, and they were not, they were doing some kind of a disservice to the population she was working with who had much worse outcomes, much like the American Indian population. So my question to you then is, since you were talking about language, um, do you think it's possible to develop a sort of universal language or knowledge like psychology or the side disciplines that can do justice to the experience um, of um, human suffering across the world or human experience across the world? And if we do develop a universal knowledge or a language to speak about these things, um, what are some of the benefits and some of the pitfalls that you see, uh, you know? Because I remember you've written an old article, I'll come to that in a minute, about um, something like that in one of the chapters. Well, the desire for a universal language is to facilitate common communication among clinicians and professionals and policymakers and so on, and um, to try very hard to be using the same language to identify the same kinds of uh, experiences of disorder and distress. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's what uh, psychiatry has been endeavoring to do since it rejected psychoanalysis and Mm -hmm. became invested in creating diagnostic and statistical manuals that have really reliable categories. Mm -hmm. The dangers of that, of course, are that it could reify experiences of illness and suffering that are particular to this context in which the DSM is designed right. um, and actually export them to other kinds of peoples and experiences around right. the world. Right, absolutely. Um, so that's the danger of it. And I think it's general evaluation depends a lot on the degree to which you take the categories that exist at, uh, very seriously. Um, the people I know who have been involved in creating the DSMs would be the first to tell you that mm-hmm. these are stand-in categories and concepts based on the research we have, but the research we have is wholly inadequate to fully understanding Mm -hmm. what uh, categories of psychopathology might exist in human nature, so to say. Um, And therefore, they're very provisional. Um, And so if you take these categories as provisional uh, with a lot of arbitrary distinctions uh, uh, tied up in them, um, and think of it really as just a language uh, to communicate, um, that's very different than if you truly believe that we understand what these disorders are and that people have them everywhere all the time because mm-hmm. they're part of what humans are susceptible to. What's the alternative if you are worried about exporting these kinds of things? Well, one thing is recognizing that the export doesn't just happen from um, people interested in communicating and studying. It comes from capitalism and the desire and motivation for drug companies to promote uh, and sell, sell their uh, inventions. So there are other forces at work that have a big stake in these categories being exported, and that's a problem, as people like Ethan Waters and other critics have talked about for a mm-hmm. long time. But, you know, somewhere in between uh, the two extreme ends of there are only these categories, they're universal, all humans are subject to them, and it's completely relative and no suffering is shared across humanity, there are complicated things in between. And it's probable that there are some kinds of disorder we talk about that as, you know, really probably best conceived as brain disorders, Mm -hmm. where um, trying to get at what it is that distinguishes those and uh, recognizing that it's useful to talk about those across all human populations makes sense. Whereas there are other kinds of disorders that may well be mostly cultural in terms of their uh, patterning Mm -hmm. and their experience and expression. So, you know, example of the former might be schizophrenia or autism or Alzheimer's. I mean, these are things where brain pathology very clearly plays this important role. Whether there are single things is hard to say. Um, an example of the latter category where it's really heavily culturally patterned would be something like multiple personality disorder or what we now call dissociative identity disorder, in which um, this has to do with, you know, scripts and performance and narratives and ideas of the self um, that ebb and flow, such that we had an epidemic of multiple personality disorder in the United States in the 1990s mm-hmm. um, that, you know, really is a story about culture more mm-hmm. than it is about the brain um, in ways that uh, psychiatrists and mental health professionals like to talk about psychopathology. So somewhere in this complicated mix, you want to strike a balance between useful ways to communicate about um, standardized uh, categories and concepts, at the same time not reifying them or exporting them beyond um, what uh, their provisional nature really uh, allows or affords. Mm -hmm. In in American Indian communities, there is a really uh, pretty well-developed discourse 
that I would say is really parallel to the discourse of mental health professionals when it comes to these sorts of issues. And historical trauma is the linchpin of that because it is an alternative, or we might say alternative way of talking about indigenous suffering that as outside of, in some cases, maybe rejects uh, DSM diagnostic mm-hmm. categories. Um, but it's just one piece of it. it uh, that, that discourse, the alternative discourse, uh, that is kind of parallel to psychiatry also has different views about what it means to be a healthy, well person. Um, it's not necessarily neoliberal individualism where free agents navigate free markets in pursuit of happiness and success and productivity, um, but has to do with one's location within a kinship network and position relative to the unfolding of a community's existence and so on. Um, and where the Uh, interventions that people need may not be the latest scientifically driven, empirically supported treatments um, that are based on, you know, uh, psychological understandings and scientific know-how, but rather people would say a return to tradition and the revitalization of of indigenous healing Mm -hmm. are the therapies that people talk about wanting most. And even the evaluation of whether uh, these interventions can be said to work um, has an alternative place in this alternative discourse, which Mm -hmm. is less about uh, whether science can tell us what's efficacious and more about indigenous uh, ways of knowing or what some people call indigenous epistemologies. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, all of all this is very readily present as you go around Indian country and learn these things. I think it's a huge scholarly project to try to anchor these down and figure out what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these claims. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that these claims uh, should be widely accepted necessarily. At this point, I'm describing what we see and hear in Indian country and that scholars should know about and asking the rest of the mental health professions to grapple seriously with these claims because I think they do have important implications for how we think about what we do. Yeah, absolutely. So you you just talked about some of these interventions and looking at their efficacy, right? And I remember, I think you wrote a paper that was comparing traditional healing and psychotherapy. This was some time yeah. ago. So, right. um, and you... You talk about something you call anti-colonial prescription of healing. I like that phrase, so I kept it here. Um, Could you say more about some of these, uh, what you've talked about in terms of traditional healing methods? I have uh, studied some of them in other countries, but I am very unaware of what what they imply or involve and what have we learned in terms of how useful and efficacious they are when people from indigenous communities actually use them. Um, could you speak some more about what they yeah, are? Sure. Yeah, well, um, the, the point to start perhaps is to try to get a handle on thinking about indigenous healing. Mm-hmm. And um, healing is a term that is often opposed to something like treatment mm-hmm. uh, because it has a different sort of focus and a different set of origins. Um, but the thing about healing is to recognize that indigenous communities uh, prior to the arrival of biomedicine um, had what we might refer to as doctoring practices. Um, which are broader medical practices that uh, involve all aspects of what goes wrong when a person gets ill. Um, And so if it's setting broken bones or uh, taking an herbal medicine for uh, an infection or whatever it might be, Mm -hmm. um, that kind of healing might be described as sort of curative healing. This is after the anthropologist Jim Waldron has helped to helpfully ex- elaborate on this distinction. Whereas when we talk about healing today, it more often than not in indigenous communities is referring to kind of a transformative healing. And transformative healing is less about cur- cur- curing people from illnesses or diseases and more about transforming the self into something that's more conducive to well-being. Um, and so it's more of a process. It has less of a de- stated endpoint. It maybe never ends because one is involved in healing one's entire life and so on. And when it comes to uh, the alternative discourse about mental health, the kind of healing that people have in mind often is of this transformative mm-hmm. variety. First and foremost, I'd say in Indian country, it's about spirituality and ceremonial participation for many, many people who advocate it. And by this, I mean indigenous ceremonial participation, whether it's sweat lodge ceremonies, Sundance ceremonies, all the different kinds of ceremonies that are really diverse across different tribal nations. Um, But the operating principle in a lot of these has to do with accessing power from those beings above who circulate life. Mm-hmm. Life being a concept, um, a religious concept that has to do with um, 
that which drives out death, infirmity, poverty. It's just about blessings and prosperity all around. And so anytime one participates in a ceremony, which involves, of course, prayer and sacrifice and uh, interaction with those powerful beings that are way more influential and potent than human beings, um, one benefits in ways that are conducive to health. Uh, so uh, prayer is health inducing mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. sense of the word. So, um, so basically indigenous religion, religions, we should say plural, um, are an, a means to health. And um, so participation in any of those kinds of things are understood and said to be uh, conducive to recovery from problems that people might have, including mental health problems. Now, one can be a skeptic about this, as uh, scientists are, and try to ask for better information about mm -hmm. the degree to which someone who's caught up in addiction and uh, has not been able to function in everyday life and be a good kin uh, member to members of their family and so on, um, how well this can help them. And it's very difficult to design the kinds of studies that you find in right. everyday psychiatry to test that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Certainly what we do have are... Um, thousands and thousands of Indian people wherever you go throughout mm -hmm. the indigenous communities who will attest to the fact that they've contended with these kinds of serious mm -hmm. issues and turn to culture and tradition and sacred indigenous ceremony and come out of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. even when it seems uh, to have been very quite severe. Um, now, of course, people do that in everyday life too. We can imagine mm -hmm. almost Christian style conversion experiences where people whose lives are um, very chaotic and disabled and um, able to turn their lives around by becoming born again or like that. So it, it's not completely unfamiliar to the human experience of mm. recognizing and understand these things. The question, I suppose, is whether you can really harness these kinds of alternative approaches uh, to, to orchestrate transformation for people or whether it's the kind of thing that they have to come to organically mm -hmm. and uh, uh, by virtue of their own interest and participation, find their way out of these kinds of conditions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what you're talking about reminds me of my work in the in the Indian mountains, in the Himalayas. And I was talking to people who were using similar ceremonies, which they call joggers, um, to deal with anything from back pain to, you know, infertility to what we would call schizophrenia, in which they were having these massive hallucinations of visual but their response to them, because they don't have a biomedical model to kind of mold their discourse, their response was of sometimes boredom, sometimes joy, sometimes, um, um, and that kind of ties in with, the, I think, Lerman's research of, you know, people's responses to hallucinations across cultures are not necessarily of fear and distress. So, yeah, absolutely. There, there, have, been, there have been these parallels in the way people have tried to take care, you know, of their own um, miseries and their own suffering. Had a person go for this jogger because he had back pain or, you know, or his sister was suddenly seeing these things and the same thing. So, and they swear by how effective it is. Um, they would keep talking about it. You just have to be there to see it. Um, how one moment this person is doing this and the next moment after the ceremony is over, just everything is fine. And they, they go back to their lives and they have children and they go to work and they're not in hospitals for 20 years. So, um, but again, very little research on that, um, especially the kind, you know, uh, we consider good research or important research. And Well, I think that, that, you know, the, the research, there's a wide range of research mm -hmm. that can be brought to bear on those questions. Mm -hmm. And one of them is simply following people up a little bit. So, you know, every healing tradition has adherents who will claim that they've experienced miracle cure. Right, as a result. right. And of course, we want to be skeptical about random yeah. claims because whatever thing you think is most promising or important, you can equally probably mm -hmm. identify something you think is ridiculous and foolish. And, and yet all of them can claim people who say that they've been miraculously cured. So mm -hmm. I think it is the case that it's not just taking people's word for it mm -hmm. only. We want, do want to yeah. um, bring to bear some questions and some follow-up to try to trace what makes the most yeah. sense. Okay. So following up on what you were saying towards the end, you were talking about, uh, following up on people's claims and not just taking their word for the miraculous healing. And uh, that, that sounds absolutely like very, very important. I get that. But that does take me to the special place that psychology has, right? In which we take people's claim of feeling better as their claim, as efficacy, or in, in some cases we should. I mean, sometimes we ignore it, you know, when we're looking at outcome measures and there is nowhere in there is the person's or the client's claim of, um, whether 
the therapy or the medication actually help them. So what do you think is a place of psychology when it comes to claims of feeling better or um, being cured, uh, especially when it comes to things like um, uh, depression or having anxiety or um, even, you know, hallucinations in the case of many of these communities? Well, uh, you know, none of the conditions that mental health professionals deal with, or mm -hmm. certainly that the DSM would afford diagnosis of, can occur absent, um, you know, clinically significant impairment or distress. So there has to be something really wrong. I mean, it's having hallucinations is not a disorder. Mm -hmm. um, it's only as it, you know, is syndromal with other kinds of right. uh, problems that one would ever diagnose that appropriately. Um, so if it doesn't have distress or impairment, then it's not anything mm -hmm. to necessarily frame in that way or to try to treat in terms of the kind of medical intervention we have in mind. Uh, on the other hand, when people are suffering, we of course recognize, number one, that people's feeling states uh, ebb and flow. So that's why it, someone telling you they feel better um, is better than them telling you they feel worse, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they do feel better in the moment. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're going to feel better in 24 hours or 12 hours or next week or next month. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, assessing whether people feel better is really important, but we would be remiss if that's all we assessed. Right. Um, because the second thing is that people will tell their therapist they feel better because they don't want to hurt their therapist's feelings. So even when they don't feel better, they'll tell you they they're feel better. Bad. So, you know, we just have to have some basic uh, skepticism around mm -hmm. recognizing the limitations of all of our sources of knowledge and understanding about these things and to respond appropriately mm -hmm. to try and ensure that we're doing our clients uh, the best service we can. Right. And in that respect, you know, um, more observational behavioral signs um, and, and um, of course, symptom reports, being a little more... Uh, rigorous in our assessment of the kinds of issues they're feeling. Well, one Because if a person feels much, much better, but is still spending five hours a day washing their hands, I'm not sure what that's really worth. Thank you for answering that. All right, so let me go on to the next question. Um, you wrote about resi residential schools for American Indians, and I had never heard about that, and um, that is quite horrifying, absolutely. Um, so what I want to ask you is, as a discipline and a culture and a nation, uh, where are we in terms of acknowledging long-term intergenerational impacts of colonialism? And where do you see this work heading in the future? Yeah, um, I'm, I don't think that the United States is all that aware or recognizing of its colonial history. I think the everyday people in the United States tend to be aware that Native people got a raw deal. Mm -hmm. I don't think they really understand the full extent of what that raw deal entailed. I don't think right. they understand that people today still suffer because of the arrangements that were set up at the birth of the nation. Um, and I don't think most people today have any clue about what Indian people want or need. Um, we live in a paradoxical society where Indians are simultaneously everywhere and nowhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere in the sense that you turn on your TV and you watch a sports game and there's mascots and you see, um, you know, Land O'Lakes Butter with an Indian maiden depicted at the shopping when you're shopping. Um, and street names everywhere are named after, states are named after Indians. The map are full of Indian words and Indian um, names. Um, and people are, are aware of Indian presence, even in our absence. So most Americans don't know any Indian people, yeah. aren't aware they know any Indian people. Um, if you try to survey people as to which American Indians they are familiar with, they might be able to come up with a historical figure like Crazy Horse or Sitting Bull or Chief Joseph or some few of the people who were historically celebrated in some way. Um, and so that kind of invisibility, even as people seem to um, or state that they do know something about us, and then it tends to be wrong in many instances, um, is itself a challenge to overcome. And it means that anytime Indian people try to speak uh, to an audience, a public, in some public, um, there's always this interesting pull uh, from an audience about hearing what they already know or hearing what um, will fit with their preconceptions. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes very difficult to speak in a way that uh, might be truly self-determined. So um, that's why the language of these things is uh, a challenge. It's always a, an issue to try to invent how to talk about ourselves. The federal government actually has a trust obligation to care for Indian people uh, because of the history of treaties and the history of the reservations. Um, this trust obligation entails federal dollars and federal services for healthcare, for example, or for education or for 
various kinds of Indian welfare concerns. And yet it's never funded properly. We get pennies on the dollar of what would require to do this well. Um, and so anytime we uh, try to uh, make a claim for having a better quality of life that we anchor in the treaties and in the exchange of land for promises and those sorts of things, it's hard to get a hearing. So um, I think the public in general is pretty ignorant. I think that uh, Indian society is a complicated thing because there's so much diversity, because the legal political status is so unusual, and because uh, the history um, you know, varies a lot depending on what region of the country you're from and which tribal uh, community you come from. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are real challenges to representation. And yet that representation is crucial because uh, how else are people going to know uh, to press our government to do the right thing by our small populations. Mm-hmm. And the kind of resources that would improve our lives dramatically are really not very large compared to other sorts of pressing needs. A couple of fighter bombers converted to Indian affairs uh, resources would probably do it. Um, so in this respect, it's not necessarily that hard of a problem uh, to address with the additional resources that would make good headway. Uh, even as we acknowledge that there are certain kinds of um, arrangements that make it difficult for um, longer term solutions uh, to come about. So, you know, one of the best studies on mental health that I've ever seen, um, Indian mental health, in, was the Great Smoky Mountain study, which happened in North Carolina. And the Great Smoky Mountain study followed young people over the course of their development and assessed them for mental health problems so they could find out at what age these kids start to develop mental health problems and how prevalent they are over the course of their lifespan. And it's followed them to young adulthood. Uh, But what's interesting is they followed both um, Indian youth in Appalachia as well as white youth in Appalachia. And a natural experiment occurred, which is to say it wasn't planned, anything the um, designers of the studies, the researchers could control. But what happened was um, the tribal community in question developed a casino after the study had started and started to have an income as a tribe and started to distribute some of that income to the families, the Indian families over the course of this longitudinal assessment of mental health problems. And so right in the middle, you have a family income supplement coming to the native households, but not the white households. Um, Their kids, um, the trajectory of growth in mental health problems slowed that uh, mental health um, was not as, uh, Uh, problematic over time as it was for the white youth who didn't have the income supplement. So that tells you that income and adequate resources in your household matter a lot. Now, they didn't uh, design the study to do this. Of course, it was an accident. Um, And so they can only speculate as to Mm -hmm. why that might have mattered. But, you know, one speculation is poor families involve parents or maybe a Mm -hmm. single parent working multiple jobs or they're not there to supervise their kids in the way that if you are more affluent or even a stay-at-home parent can do. Um, And so having an income supplement maybe means you can quit your third job and be around your kids more, supporting them and supervise them in particular because kids are at risk, you know, particularly in adolescence for getting into all kinds of trouble if they're not supervised. So um, that could explain in part, but that's a little hypothetical because it wasn't designed as this. My point is simply this. Resource infusion can matter in terms of whether mental health conditions uh, become more or less afflicting of people. And so in this respect, my sense about the best single best thing that would alter mental health in indigenous communities is um, livelihoods, meaningful livelihoods, and you know, a, a good job that uh, has something that can make you proud and organize your life and keep you busy and um, so on. So, you know, we can train all the counselors in the world and send as much psychiatric medication mm-hmm. to the reservation as there is on, on uh, available. Um, but the mental health professions, the mental health sector is not going to solve the problems of Indian country. The problem of Indian country goes so far beyond that. And so it's sort of like Band-Aid on a spurting artery at this point. It's better than nothing, but it's not going to solve the issue. And so that's why I think it's incumbent on those of us who happen to be in the academy, whose job in part is to try think new thoughts and explore new avenues and uh, innovate around what we might be doing differently, to think outside of the box and to try to come up with possibilities, solutions um, that people haven't tried yet or that people haven't recognized as having potential. For example, you know, harnessing traditional ceremony, sacred practice as a mental health intervention is not something people would necessarily uh, run to right away. 
And yet there's a plausible reason why this could be very useful for some mental health conditions in Indian country. Some, I say, is it going to be useful for schizophrenia? Is it going to be useful for Alzheimer's or useful? Probably not. Those are the kind of conditions where the kinds of interventions you need are not of the sort we're talking about. But those are not the epidemic problems in Indian communities. The epidemic problems are addiction and trauma and violence and suicide. Can it involve, affect those kinds of problems? Very likely, yes. And why? Because those behaviors and conditions are heavily mediated by the meanings we make. Alzheimer's is not mediated by the meanings we make. Mm-hmm. It's going to uh, follow its course and, and lead to disability, irrespective of how we understand it and make meaning of it. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to substance dependence, when it comes to suicide, when it comes to uh, traumatic experience, um, those are things that matter because of the sense we make of them. And, mm-hmm. and those senses we make of them are patterned. And a lot of it is tied up in the colonial experience in which our own self-image is tied up in expectations and understandings um, that follow from uh, the idea that we are less than worthy of other human beings. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, a return to tradition, a return to ceremony is not just religious, although that is really at its core, of course, what it's about, but it's also about identity and uh, well-being and belonging and plugging into something that's continuous with the past rather than discontinuous with the past. And for many, many Native people, it's really powerful to do that. I say many, because it's not everyone. There yeah, are Indian absolutely. people who are born again, evangelical mm-hmm. Christians who think that traditional ceremonies are diabolical. So, yeah. you know, there's a variety. It's not for everybody all yes. the time, but, but these are important trends mm-hmm. that do have real potential uh, for the kinds of problems that Indian people suffer from. And mm-hmm. so trying to figure out more about uh, their promise seems to me really urgent. I think uh, the whole movement and uh, writers who've been talking about decolonizing psychology speak of that, you know, uh, the problems that, uh, for example, the problem of resources that if we don't look at them carefully enough, we can just assume or reduce them to interior problems of just psychology or mental health, but they kind of stem from these things that are happening around people and um, the importance of paying attention to that. And like you said, it's a small bandaid to only address what's happening inside people in the face of abject discrimination and prejudice around them is kind of a bandage solution. You said something um, about meaningful livelihoods and that uh, then that took me to one of the papers in which you were talking about uh, socio-culturally mediated meaning and the importance of, you know, culturally unique meanings that in the lives of people. And I was wondering if you could say something more about that. Um, I think you used it in terms of uh, in a paper on decontextualizing DSM and you talk about how certain diagnoses have become decontextualized and the meaning making process of indigenous community tends to revolve around a very relational idea of the self and how decontextualizing it does a disservice to their experience that is you know not not an egocentric concept of self but instead a sociocentric concept concept of self could you yeah. speak more about that such culturally unique meaning making in all of this well, the DSM, the modern DSMs, again, in that rebellion against psychoanalysis, really tried to be, you know, quote, a theoretical, unquote, mm-hmm. which is to say to stay away from origin stories, etiologies of these disorders, um, heavily theorized understandings of psychodynamics and what have you, to really be just descriptive at the level of signs and symptoms. Um, but of course, it's impossible to be completely a theoretical. You have to have a set of assumptions about mm human emotion and human experience to even posit what kinds of illnesses would be relevant. And um, I'm not trying to make a claim for radical alterity, where as if indigenous people are not modern in the sense that many other people are, and indigenous people are so different that these categories and concepts can't work ever. Um, But we do want to recognize some subtleties and difference that I think can matter in some instances. So if you are coming from a community in which you have been socialized to be more, much more relationally attuned mm-hmm. in your everyday experience and where your identity is tied up in a, a collective identity of kin, for example, uh, family reputation, um, relationship and roles to other people, um, this is not foreign to everyone. I mean, I think uh, mm-hmm. human, humans around the world are often able and willing to exercise both interdependence and independence, mm-hmm. depending on what's called for in a context and how they're socialized. But I think that c- certain socialization experiences uh, 
can lead you to rest more easily in one or the other of those kinds of orientations or the situations will call for more of them in certain settings than others, such that interdependence can be something that uh, would be much more um, readily apparent in um, indigenous societies. And that interdependence extends all the way down to the foundations of human experience. It used to be said in psychology that there were you know, six basic emotions and you could label what these emotions were in some abstracted way. But the problem with that view is that it fails to recognize that emotion is itself culturally constituted, um, that these are pattern things that we are socialized into. So emotion without the meaningfulness of a script and an expectation and a label in a language is nothing more really than impulse. Mm -hmm. um, human emotion is, a, is an impulse put together with a whole frame of meaning making. And so in an interdependent context, like you can find in many indigenous communities today, the emotions that seem to stand out that I recognize people talking about are what we might call social emotions. Social emotions. And, um, you know, a big one I was saying on the Northern Plains is pity or yes. what might be described as compassion. Um, but people use the English language term pity. And it has to do with the understanding religiously that powerful beings can help humans, um, but they're not necessarily going to do that unless you can get their attention and call down their pity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, ceremony and ritual is about um, suffering, a performance of suffering um, that can evoke the pity of these mm -hmm. beings who otherwise are uh, busy doing other things and are otherwise indifferent to your particular condition. So pity is huge in Indian country, especially on the plains again, um, as a social emotion. It's a mm -hmm. feeling state, but it's a feeling state that's cast within a relational network. Similarly, jealousy is mm -hmm. the kind of thing that people uh, just talk about a lot. In fact, people can recognize when there's such a thing as insane jealousy. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that domestic violence can break out or family violence mm -hmm. can break out in the context of this insane jealousy. Again, jealousy is a feeling state, but it's also evoked in a relational context. Or we can tease people for pouting. Um, pouting is an expression that you've been mistreated by other people or not really valued properly. And it's a display not only of a feeling state, but of uh, uh, the breach of a social expectation or a kinship obligation, whatever it might be. In other words, there's a whole parallel set of ways to think about what emotional experience and expression is that come with cultural patterns and cultural scripts that cast that within a relational framework. Well, in the DSM, we have mood disorders. And the mood disorders are pathologies of mood that depend descriptively and phenomenologically on certain mood states going awry. Um, what would it look like to develop a set of categories and concepts of pathology that were grounded in social emotions, such that maybe there is insane jealousy, or maybe there is um, reckless rage, or maybe there is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, an excess of, of pouting or something like that. So it's just tantalizing to want to think about the alternative possibilities, mm -hmm. which any effort to try to develop a universalizing, a theoretical approach really can't do. Um, so then you have to take, if you want to remain in communication with other professionals who use that same system, you have to like figure out how to qualify it in ways mm -hmm. that can convey what you're uh, really just describing. Um, and then there's a the question of to what degree is it doing violence? to impose those kinds of categories that may not be fitting so well. Um, and in that respect, I think it depends a lot, again, on what the mental health establishment is making of those categories. If people are recognizing, as many therapists and clinicians do, it's just a way of talking about these things. There's no really real to it. It's just a way I could get reimbursement from the insurance for this profession. If they're doing all that, maybe it's not such a big deal. But of course, patients often want to know, what is my diagnosis, doc? And then you explain to them and tell them. And if you're not careful, they will reify it themselves in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And that creates this really strange condition, which uh, means that therapists and professionals socialize their patients into experiences and expressions of disorders right. that then are researched over time based on the people who've been socialized to experience and express in that way, that then feeds back into the knowledge base. So you get this very funny loop happening in which the knowledge created depends on the knowledge that was disseminated to begin with, um, which alters uh, a mode of life over time. Mm -hmm. So PTSD, before PTSD came on board, psychological trauma, you look 100 years before then, when um, people were... Uh, in railway accidents in Britain, mm -hmm. when psychological mm -hmm. trauma first originated, and the 
symptoms they had after they stumbled off a wrecked railroad car um, included some symptoms that we'd recognize as PTSD today, but a lot that we don't. Photophobia, palpitations, mm-hmm. unsteady gait. Mm-hmm. There were lots of symptoms that they Rarely had. Rarely spine syndrome, I think it, it is what it used to yeah, be. Yeah, spine. Yeah, right. right. I remember. Yeah. Um, and so, but once you posit, well, PTSD is mm-hmm. what we now call these things. And a, a patient, what's wrong with me, doc? And you talk to them about PTSD and you ex- show them the symptoms and you explain what they're experiencing. Then some symptoms probably fade away, whereas mm-hmm. others might come online, or at least it gets stamped out in a way mm-hmm. that helps to validate or legitimate our concept of PTSD in patients' lives. And then that feeds back into the research we do on those patients whose experience has been molded of a certain sort. Mm-hmm. There's nothing nefarious happening here. I'm not saying that there's um, diabolical calculations mm-hmm. to try to export things yeah. in this way, but you wed it to the capitalist endeavor of marketing, mm-hmm. especially for pharmaceuticals, then you start to have something that looks a little bit um, more dangerous. Yeah. That has been uh, an area that has been especially, you know, interesting to me. I mean, the work of Alan Young, who wrote, I think, Harmony of Illusions and mm-hmm. Steph Kraps, because I, I come from two generations of refugees, from my grandparents to my parents, of two separate conflicts. And it was always interesting to see the ways it manifested, but that had nothing to do with PTSD. It was just a very different way. And uh, also a military upbringing in which, again, there were people coming back from war, but what they were showing were not PTSD symptoms, uh, partially because when veterans in India come back from war, there is a massively like well-established system to take them back in and put them back in the lives that they have with intense support, uh, whether it's the support of going to a doctor when you feel like it, there are no waiting times, or just massive families waiting for you and you stay with your unit. So I've always wondered, you know, what, what place that has, the later meaning-making experience of coming back from war and feeling like you're still part of this huge collective. This, and this of course, a lot of that, that need not yeah. be pathological at all. Yeah. People are impacted by... Um, horrors in their lives all the time and it doesn't mean they become sick about it. Yes, absolutely. Um, Even as it might shape their identities in really profound ways. So the dilemma with historical trauma, I mean, you should know I am not one of its originators and I am not a proponent of historical Mm -hmm. trauma. I I see what it's trying to do and I also see its limitations. And I think one set of limitations is that even as it originated to try re-socialize the medical to try to recognize that indigenous mental health and other behavioral health concerns like diabetes and um, so on um, have a historical context that gave rise to these in our communities. It's trying to re-socialize the medical in that respect, that that's a good thing to do. But at the same time, it is primarily a health discourse. And if you're not going to step all the way out of health and the clinical frame of reference, then you are still involved in some degree in medicalizing the social. And so I think it help, it rides that boundary of health. Why does it do that? Because to step completely out of health is to abandon the claim on health resources. And health resources are the main way that societies right. make available help to people who are suffering in this day and age. So you can understand why you want to re- maintain your claim on health resources. But of course, that involves a casting of oppressive experience and the legacy of oppression into the broader medical theater in which it is about individuating and interior suffering, a Mm -hmm. person-centered way of viewing a problem that a clinician could actually intervene with in an individual. Mm -hmm. It distracts us away from the broader systemic and structural kinds of issues. Public health, of course, has a discourse about Mm -hmm. social structure and social determinants of health and those sorts of things. It's writing that line itself in that way that that is interesting. And it's trying to um, re-socialize the medical in that same way. And I think Mm -hmm. historical trauma is doing that same kind of thing, which it, it, yeah. on the one hand, we can appreciate it for its re-socialization of what has been clinical or medical. Okay. At the same time, we recognize that it's still playing that game to a degree as well. So it's, it's a pretty complex relationship. I mean, that's, I guess, what, what, what your last article was, um, the complexity of the concept of historical trauma and even the work that has been done on it. Um, yeah, absolutely. So my last thing that I will talk to you about is uh, one of your papers, um, you were talking about how um, we tend to believe that the things that we create are knowledge. So you say we have knowledge and they have beliefs. Right? That was the phrase that you had used in terms of the fact that uh, 
We believe that our practices are objective, but they are equally embedded in the practices of power ethnocentrism. And it's evident in the way um, non-Western cultures are talked about or constructed by Westerners, that we have knowledge and they have beliefs. Um, and you say that the concepts and categories of psychology are not tr transcendent or culture-free. And I would just like you to end on um, a note about, you know, this thing that you said. I really like that phrase, we have knowledge and they have beliefs. It's succinct and it's quite powerful because I've heard that even, you know, practicing in India or being here. You know, when we talk about the stuff we have, we talk about it as knowledge. And um, even when we talk about the efficacy of traditional healing, it suddenly we turn it into the, the language changes in the way we talk about it. It might be helpful to maintain a distinction between knowledge and belief. Right. I, mean, I think that's probably useful conceptually. But to categorically assert that um, the mental health professions have knowledge and that, you know, indigenous peoples or any other local community that, you know, um, proclaims certain kinds of things to be true are merely beliefs is itself a, a deformity of um recognition of how knowledge circulates and is made. And the problem with it, I think, is to uniformly um, credit the mental health professions with only having knowledge and not beliefs is wrong because mental health professionals are chuck full of beliefs. In fact, um, people who are promoting evidence-based practice in the mental health professions are, abs are making war on the fact that too much of what the mental health professionals do is belief-based and not knowledge-based, they would say. It's not accountable to what we seem to know scientifically. So it's not the case that mental health professionals only have knowledge, not beliefs, but their certification and licensure and all of the expertise, the way expertise is um, codified um, leads to the benefit of the doubt around the pro proclamations they make as being authorized knowledge in some way. Whereas um, local communities of people don't only have mere beliefs. They also um, know things and um, know things that are true um, and um, can be uh, important collaborators and leaders in helping to chart what um, we can learn about them um, in terms of their own understanding of their own experiences. Um, and so it's really the opposition that is the problem. And recognizing on the one hand that local people have a mix of um, uh, understanding, some of which are true, some of which are probably untrue, and some of which uh, we don't know. And so it requires some refinement of exploration to sort out that stuff that people in everyday life, unless they're academics, don't have time, energy, inclination for. Um, and so one of the one of this uh, potential is, I think, is important to recognize is the role of scholars in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, scholarly activity is a particular endeavor that obviously is not widely celebrated in some quarters today, um, but um, provides people with a livelihood to be thinkers and to be explorers and to attend to things that no one else has time to do or cares to do. So that's the issue there, I think, which is that um, mental health professionals have plenty of beliefs mm -hmm. that are not founded and that are, would be disputable and are false. Um, and local people have plenty of knowledge about things that are true. Um, but no one has a currency or a market that's immune to skepticism from anyone right. else. So it's really a question of what is the role of skepticism? How can we arbitrate skeptical inquiry in a way that will uh, make sense to different audiences? Because some audiences are more skeptical than others. Some audiences are toxically skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, they're so skeptical, they're nihilist. Um, mm -hmm. And other audiences are so gullible mm -hmm. that uh, it's... Um, borders on foolishness mm -hmm. so you know trying to figure out how to navigate the domain of people that we interact with and i think native mental health professionals and mental health researchers in particular sit in an interesting place around juxtaposing between these different audiences in ways on the one hand trying to talk to um, mental health professionals who are uh, quite confident in their knowledge I'm mean, trying to show when those go beyond what we really know and when it seems to be more belief and to try to um, jar loose um, some of the authority they wield in narrow ways to be more open-minded. And some of it is also going to some of our own tribal communities and saying, hey, you're not being skeptical enough. You're skeptical in all kinds of other ways. Uh, one family's medicine person is another family's charlatan. There's lots of ways in which native communities are skeptical. Um, 
but some things may be less so in some instances. And so wanting to say, well, wait, can we be a little more skeptical? Doesn't it matter if this is true or not? Can we, can we uh, develop an, um, a way to just assess better whether this really bears out in the way we think it does? Um, and, and why not? You know? So um, again, I think native mental health researchers and professionals are in a particularly unique way to try to speak to these different audiences. And that, that is a challenge and a demand. Um, at the same time, that's a real opportunity. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. A privilege of sorts. Um, yes, right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for this. This was, uh, this was fantastic. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.